Welcome to Church House. If I haven't already invited you and greeted you, we're glad that you are with us today. We want to get into the Word. We've had a great time of worship, experiencing the presence, the manifest presence of the Lord. Let me be clear with that. Let's get right into the Word. I heard the Father speak out of Exodus chapter 20. He said, make me an altar. Make me an altar. Make me an altar earthen altar which he qualified it and so we want to talk about that this morning we're in exodus chapter 20 i'm going to have a word of prayer and then we're going to get further into this word father we thank you for who you are what you are saying we pray that we have ears to hear father hearts to respond to what you are saying to us individually and also as the body of christ we thank you and we bless you exodus chapter 20 make me an earthen altar sacrifice your whole burnt offering your peace offering your sheep and your cattle on it i'm reading from the message translation every place where i cause my name to be honored in your worship i'll be there myself and bless you i love it i'll be there myself and bless you if you use stones to make my altar don't use dressed storm stones If you use a chisel on the stones, you'll profane the altar. Don't use steps to climb to my altar because that will expose your nakedness. It's Exodus chapter 20 towards the end of the chapter in the message translation. In Exodus chapter 20 verse 1, he says this, God spoke all these words, I am God, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the life of slavery. He says, no other gods, verse three, no other gods, only me, no other gods, only me. Verse four, no carved gods of any size, shape, or form of anything, whatever, whether of things that fly or walk or swim. Don't bow down to them and don't serve them because I am, I am God. And I'm a most jealous God. Recently, my wife, Jill, uh, went through the house uh, looking for anything that had the form of idolatry. Anything that, that walked, that flew, or that swam and removed it from our house. So... I had some, I had like a small crocodile. I had some other little trinkets and things like that. And uh, they're gone. Uh, (laughs) They're gone. Yeah. And uh, because we have to look for these carved items. This was, I had things that were made out of wood. They looked great. They were beautiful. Uh, I had an alligator, as I said, a crocodile, whatever that was. We had to remove those things. We had to look for those things that were carved, carved gods of any size, shape, or form, anything, whatever, whether of things that fly, walk, or swim. I heard the Father say these words. At every turn, at every corner, the Father is giving his people an opportunity to align themselves with his wishes. His wishes are what we just discussed. He reminds the people of who they were so they can see their plight before God, before he stepped into their situation. He reminds the children of Israel, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt. And then he tells them what he requires. Then he tells his people, don't place anything before me, describing idol worship, right? And God, God was, God was a jealous God in Exodus chapter 20. God is a jealous God today. 2,000 years later, he is still a jealous God. The fact that it's in the Old Testament doesn't mean that God has changed his thoughts. He hasn't changed his thoughts about desiring for us to worship him. He hasn't changed his thoughts on having other gods before him. He created the things in He created things in six days and rested and commands us to rest following the same pattern. That hasn't 
that hasn't really changed either. And God created the world and that hasn't passed away. He did it in six days. That hasn't changed. What he was showing me was that the fact that his son Jesus Christ came into the world did not change everything that was in the Old Testament. It didn't do away with everything that was a shadow and a type and some things were just reality, the facts. The facts are he created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested. It hasn't changed that we observe one particular day, maybe it's the weekend for many, but for us it's, it's Sunday, like we're worshiping together on Sunday and that is also a day of rest. Uh, for some it's a Saturday where they call it the Sabbath. And so that, that, that hasn't really changed where we find a day of rest that should be given to him. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed that he is a jealous God. It hasn't changed that God desires for us to give ourselves, our focus completely to him and not to other uh, graven Im images. I want to go to Revelations 2 and look at verses 1 through 5. He began to talk to me about grace. Grace allows you to keep living although you've placed other gods before the Father. Many people talk about the grace message. It's His grace that allows us to continue to live while we have created other gods alongside Him. That's where grace comes in. In Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse 1, he says this, Write this to Ephesus, to the angel of the church, the one with seven stars in his right fist grip, striding through the golden seven light circle, speaks this, I see what you've done, your hard, hard work. You refuse to quit. I know you can't stomach evil that you weed out apostolic pretenders. I know your persistence, your courage in my cause, that you never wear out. This is, this is great. This is great. I mean, how many of us are like that? But he says in verse 5, but you walked away from your first love. Why? What's going on with you? What's going on with you anyway? Do you have any idea how far you've fallen? A Lucifer fall. A Lucifer fall. He says, turn back, recover your dear earthly love. No time to waste for I'm well on my way to removing your light from the golden circle. If you're asking yourself, what's the golden circle? What is that light? That was what he talked about in the very beginning, in the, in the first verse that the one with the seven stars in his right fist grip, striding through the golden seven light circle. And he's, he's saying, I know you've got all that going on. I know you're bright. I know you look a certain way. I know that you're working. I know that you can't stand certain things. You can't stomach evil. But when he gets to verse four, he says, but there's one thing that's concerning, and that is you've walked away from your first love. I've been hearing this all week that we have to get back to our first love. I know you want to know the times and the seasons, and he's told us what these times and the seasons that we're in. No, it's not about the rapture. We're not, we're not getting ready to be raptured and all of that kind of stuff. We need to get in line with the times of season and return to our first love. It's important that we turn back to him, do a turnaround. Amen. I, I just began to ask him, you know, Father, what are you saying? What are you, what are you saying? So that I communicate exactly what you're saying. He said, just as Lucifer fell, there has been a great falling away of my people. They have worked, but they have not sown into my heart. They have placed their importance before the Father. They have erected their own concept and ideas of how to serve, how to love, and how to worship me. This has become a great gulf between I am and my people who work very hard, but with 
futility for within their heart within their within their heart they have turned towards themselves another god glorifying in their achievements and ministries and all of that to the people around the people and for the people and they shine they glitter they move forward but they have failed to continuously sow seed into the relationship with the Father, the relationship with I Am. And therefore, they must turn away from the idolatry and return to seek my face. He goes on to say, I have not created a people for myself to love another. I have called unto thee, and I Am expects worship to rise as a sweet aroma in my nostrils. Use this time, this moment that you have to return to my face, to hear my voice, to not be afraid, to not be ashamed. Return with swiftness. As you go back, as you return, the Father says, I will meet you. I will meet you. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, for your word. I mean, if that's you this morning, you don't have to wait to the end of this message to, to turn, to do about face. Turn now and focus your heart and your eye on the Father that he might fill you with his love, with his light. John 4, 23 and 24 in the message version says this, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father neither here at this mountain nor there in Jerusalem. You worship guessing in the dark. We Jews, we worship in the clear light of day. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews, but the time is coming and now is. It is in fact come when what you've called will not matter when what you're called will not matter. And where you go, where you go to worship will not matter. We're worshiping in our homes. We're worshiping in our houses. We were worshiping in church. Now we're worshiping in our houses. That should never stop, that we are worshiping in our houses. It should never stop that we, this tabernacle, this tabernacle is being raised up and that we're worshiping out of our tabernacle, that we are creating earthen altars right here, right here. This, this earthen vessel becomes an altar and a sacrifice to the Father. That should never stop. It should never stop. I gotta go on. He says in verse 23 and 24, it's who you are and the way you live that count before God. Who you are and the way you live. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's very important. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit moving forward towards truth. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves, themselves before the Father, before the Lord, before God in worship. God is sheer being itself spirit. He is spirit. Those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, right? Their true selves in adoration. I like this scripture because it's releasing us from a lot of religious thinking so that we know how to approach God and we don't come up with ways to approach God based on what we've seen others how we've seen others, where we've seen others, 
but he's saying to us specifically, he's saying to you specifically, I want you to worship and be you. I wanna see you, the honest you. That's the word I began to hear him say. I hear the father saying very plainly, I'm not looking for religion. I am seeking honesty. I'm seeking honesty. Don't bring a vessel that doesn't represent you. Don't bring that before the Father. Bring who you are. are. <laughs> Show me your true self, he says. Don't conform yourself to religious practices and attempt to become like the person you see in a pew next to you. Don't model people. Don't model people. Model honesty and engage your spirit as you seek truth. This is turning back to the first. Remember we're talking about returning back to our first love. That was what we read first in out of Revelation, that we turn back to our first love. He says this is returning back to the first. When you move towards him in honesty, honest fashion, not religious fashion, not all this pomp and circumstance, as, you, as I call it sometimes. It, it is removing all of that, all of the fluff, and just being honest before the Father. I am will seek those who seek truth. He's looking for the people that will seek after truth. Idolatry has been found in the organization of religion. Idolatrous ways of placing man on pedestals and honoring them before the Father. Idolatrous worship as you make precious things. We talked about that. And word commitments, things that we say out of our mouth, and place them next to God as equals. This is idolatry. This is idolatry. I am a jealous God. And this means I will not tolerate having other gods before me. Whatever you place as a member of my body, you must remember that words and prophecies will all pass away. Will all pass away. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. We're just about finished here as we, as we just begin our new relationship with the Father. 1 Corinthians 13, love, this is verse seven, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and what? Endures all things. Say it with me, he love, love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Verse eight, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. What are we doing? First Corinthians, we are turning, returning, turning ourselves, our thoughts, our ways, our, our lives back to our first, our first what? Our first love, right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, endures all things. We, we are returning back to bearing all things, believing all things, hoping all things, to enduring all things, because it never ends. It never ends. It is love is our first and it is the end. It does not stop. It does not wear out. We are returning back to our first because our first is also our end. Today, we return to what is first, which is love. What is first shall be last. Return to your first love because it is also at the end. It never ends. Move away from emotional idols like fear, anxiety, trauma, emotional idols like loneliness and other emotions and responses that we cling to and that we honor and that we prioritize. 
They don't represent our honest, our truest self, but they represent our reasons not to be true worshipers. Move away from physical barriers that keep us from obtaining truth because we prefer to please our ears, our eyes, our mouths, our, our touch instead of honoring the Lord with our body. We must move away from emotional and physical idols that we've created within ourselves that keep us from being able to return to our first love and manage our relationship with the Father in honesty, seeking truth. He says this in Matthew, well, I don't want to get to Matthew yet. He says, we must return and place first things first and not our thoughts about truth and the way. Our thoughts are not high enough. Truth must be accepted as truth. Hear me, these, these are his words. Truth must be accepted as truth. You don't understand truth before accepting truth. You accept truth so you can gain understanding. Don't honor your ability to perceive and reason above the great I am. Don't honor your thoughts before you honor him. You honor him first. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 29 and, and, and verse 30, he says these words. I want you to hear these words as I close. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. Why? For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is what? It is light. We know that verse. We've We've read that verse, we've quoted this verse. This verse is, is great, but take my truth upon you. Take my teachings upon you. My teachings are truth and learn of me because my teachings are easy. They're not burdensome. They're not filled with all kinds of uh, 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 weights and measures so that you have to figure out, am I doing okay? He's saying, you don't have to take that on you. What I want you to do is take my truth upon you, my teachings upon you. They're not full of burdens. They're not full of weight. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you, find, you will find rest, the proper rest for your soul when you take on his teachings, his truth. What are we saying? He's saying what he said in Exodus. I'm a jealous God. Don't have any other gods before me. Do about face and revelation and turn and turn back to your first love. No matter how good your works are, I need you to return back to the first, first priority, which is love and God is love for God so love because he is love he is love and love never fails Corinthians tells us in chapter 13 and so it never runs out therefore we're returning back to first and last which is our father he's the alpha of love he's the omega of love we're returning we're turning our hearts back towards him and we're cutting off and loosening loosening those things that have attached themselves emotionally and physically that have been in the way of us properly worshiping him because we didn't come to him with honesty we came to him with all kinds of other things attached to us and we put that out as religious worship and he's not asking for worship that is filled with religious notions and religious thought and religious thinking and religious ways. He's looking for us to come to him as our true selves, not modeling anyone else, but modeling honesty and saying, I will be honest before you as I come before you and I pursue, I pursue truth. That is worship. That 
is the worship that he is seeking after. Because when you begin to seek after truth, he begins to seek after you. And when he finds you, he finds you looking for him. The prodigal son, when he decided he had spent all he had and come to his end, that was when he turned. He made a turn and went back to the place of first, which is his father's house. When he returned, found himself a great distance away, but able to see, he also saw that his father was looking for him. That is what our father is doing today. He's looking for us to turn because he's willing and able to embrace us and to greet us as we make our turn. Whether we have fallen like Lucifer or whether we have just fallen and we haven't been able to get up because we've fallen a short way, we must return back to him. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Father, for what you are speaking in our ears, God. Our ears, they burn to hear your truth. Our hearts, they burn to know your thoughts, to know your ways. Father, we pursue truth with our spirit in all honesty, in all honesty. We thank you, Father. We bless you, Father. We worship you, God, in spirit and in truth, Father. We embrace your teachings. We embrace your truth. We thank you. Show us, God, where we have things, silver and gold, that we have lined up next to truth. Idolatrous things, Father, that we need to remove from our presence, God, so that we can honestly approach you. Show us what these things are. Show us what the things are inside of us, in our emotions, with us physically, that we deal with on a daily basis, that is interrupting our ability to be honest. Show us what those things are so that we can pull down anything that would try to exalt itself above the knowledge of Christ. Show us what those things are today. Show us what those things are this week. In your name we pray. Amen. May God bless you guys for joining us today in worship and in worship. So when we share truth like this, this is worship. This is the spirit and truth. This is what worship is. And he's, he's even here in this moment. As we began to seek after him, he showed up. He showed up because we honored and remembered his name. He comes into rooms where his name is being exalted, honored, and remembered, and truth is being pursued. So thank you for joining me in pursuing truth. If you wanna give, we hope you do, because you should. You should. Yes, you should. You can do so online at www.pdcgive.com pdcgive.com. You fill out the stuff, you, you, and you log in, and you're able to give. I think you only have to go through the information, all of the information as registering and all of that one time, and then you're just able to log in, give, and you're all good. God bless you. Remember that giving into the anointing is one of the most important things and fertile things that you can do for your life by putting seed in the ground when the ground is ready. The ground is ready now. The ground is right now. God bless you. And remember, he is still on the throne. He is still on the throne. We look forward to being with you again. God bless you.